Sterling Marlin leads. It was a great day for us. The car ran flawless. Caution flag. Right? Johnny Vincent up on the wall. The wall. This brings out our full caution of the day. Teams spend hours building cars in the shop. They bring them to the track and use them to chase their dreams. But when that car is no longer needed, what happens to it? Race cars and their craftsmanship live on, sometimes for a lot longer than realized. Like individual drivers have stories, so do the cars themselves. They go back to the track for decades, their accomplishments carried with them. Sometimes they fade away in front of everyone. There's a lot of history hidden under the sheet metal. One of the most popular super speedway cars of the early 2000s was a Ganassi Racing chassis number 005. Behind the wheel, Sterling Marlin turned this car into a constant threat. Built as a Chevy Monte Carlo in early 2000, it was first owned by Sabco Racing. The first confirmed race for it was at Talladega in April of that year. A great car from the start, Sterling led 21 laps on the way to an 8th place finish. The next two races were much worse. At Daytona in July, the car started 39th and finished 25th. At Talladega in October, Sterling blew an engine and finished 41st. In 2001, Dodge returned to NASCAR with Sabco Racing having been bought out by Chip Ganassi. The new Dodge Intrepid sheet metal turned 005 into one of the fastest cars in the sport. Its first run was the Twin 125 qualifying race. Running fourth when the green flag waved for a one-lap shootout, Marlin timed the restart perfectly. With a push from Jerry Nadeau, Sterling passed Michael Waltrip, Jeff Gordon, and finally Dale Earnhardt in a thrilling pass on the apron. Marlin's victory in the qualifying race was technically the first win for Dodge in NASCAR since November 1977. It made him one of the favorites to win his third Daytona 500. In the Great American Race, Marlin's car was one of the fastest, leading 39 laps. Boy, Sterling does not want to re relinquish that lead. He is just hanging on. Oh! Look at Earnhardt. Sterling got into Earnhardt. He's getting, Dale is doing everything he can to keep, keep Sterling behind him because Dale knows that Sterling's got a fast car. On the final lap, Marlin tried one last pass to the inside, briefly taking third before falling back. Racing hard, Earnhardt and Marlin touched in turn three, and NASCAR was changed forever. 005 returned to the track at Talladega and was even more dominant. Marlin qualified second and led 51 laps, but slipped back at the end of the race and finished 23rd. In the 2001 Pepsi 400, the car won the pole, and Sterling led 20 laps, but was taken out in a crash with 19 to go. Oh, a lot of damage to that automobile. After leading four laps at Talladega in October, Marlin was taken out in a crash on the final lap. The 2002 Daytona 500 was 005's best chance to win the sport's biggest race. It was easily the fastest car, leading a race high 78 laps. On a restart with five laps to go, Marlin went to the inside of Jeff Gordon to take the lead, and Gordon made a late block. Gordon is in the grass! After the contact, Marlin beat Ward Burton to the caution flag to hold the lead of the race, but a red flag was thrown to ensure a green flag finish. Under that red flag, Sterling got out of the car. The car Sterling Marlin is jumping out of his car. He's going around to look at the right front fender. But, oh, he can't do that. You can't work on your car under the red flag. That's the NASCAR rule. Pull it off a little bit. You're not allowed hey, to work on out. your car they under the red flag. Off. They're saying that he's got to start all the way at the back of the field. Sterling recovered to finish eighth. Over the next two races, 005 had finishes of fifth at Talladega and third at Daytona. In October, Marlin broke his neck at Kansas, which meant Jamie McMurray made his Cup Series debut in the car at Talladega. After qualifying fifth, McMurray finished 26th, one lap down. The return for redemption in the 2003 Daytona 500 was ruined by a yellow line rule violation. On lap 70, Marlin was black flagged and finished 17th in the rain-shortened race. At Talladega two months later, the car finished 6th. Over the next year, the team used a different chassis before 005 returned to Talladega in April 2004. In its comeback race, 005 lost a tire with 40 laps to go and fell out shortly after with overheating problems. A 20th at Daytona and a crash at Talladega ended the season poorly. 
For 2005, a Dodge Charger body was put on the car. In its fourth Daytona 500, 005 finished eighth. After using a different car at Talladega, 005 returned for one final cup race at Daytona in July. A disappointing 22nd was a last the cup race for the chassis. It was at this time when the car took on new life in the ARCA series. At the end of 2005, Cunningham Motorsports became an official Dodge driver development team. As a result, they got possession of 005 from Ganassi Racing. At this point, detailed results aren't available. Between 2010 and 2015, Cunningham Motorsports won three races at Talladega, and it's likely 005 got at least one of those wins. One car on the team got two of those wins. Certainly knows how to get around this racetrack with two victories with this same race car. Let's see if they can do it for a third time today. In 2017, Cunningham Motorsports switched to Fords, which meant after being a Dodge Charger for the last 12 years, 005 was rebodied as a Ford Fusion. But like many historic cars, the end story is unclear. In 2017, Shane Lee confirmed the car was still used by Cunningham and was raced by one of the teams at Talladega that year. Attempts to find its whereabouts went unanswered. It's possible this historic car still races with Chad Bryant racing. For now, the story goes on. Cup cars being sold to ARCA teams is a common story. The first chassis that Hendrick Motorsports built ended up living a long and successful life after it left the Cup Series. In the first six years of their existence, Hendrick Motorsports bought their chassis already built from Mike Laughlin. In late 1989, the Hendrick team made their first attempt at building their own chassis. The first one was known as Dusty. The car made its on-track debut as part of the R&D team of Newman Hendrick Racing, co-owned by Hendrick and Paul Newman. A fast car from the start, Greg Sachs drove it to a second-place finish. According to crew chief Gary DeHart, Dale Earnhardt was impressed with Dusty and asked how he could get a chassis like that. Sachs and Dusty then sat on the pole at Daytona for the Pepsi 400. At the end of lap one, Sachs was knocked around and touched off one of the biggest crashes in NASCAR history. Oh no, Sachs is in trouble! And takes Penny with him. And we're gonna have a terrific crash here as Dusty was rebuilt and was driven by Ricky Rudd in races until the end of 1992, but never won a race. It was then sold to an unknown ARCA team. When that team shut down at the end of 1997, Bobby Gerhardt bought the car and made it his super speedway car. By this point, the original Lumina bodywork was replaced by a Monte Carlo. Behind the wheel of Dusty, Gerhardt finished 8th in 1998, before winning his first race at Daytona in 1999. Gerhardt drove Dusty again at Daytona in 2000 to a second-place finish. At that point, it became a backup car. It was raced for the final time at Talladega in 2004, when Boston Reed drove it in an alliance with Hendrick Motorsports. Reed led 13 laps, but crashed out late. After its racing days were over, Dusty was bought again by Hendrick Motorsports, who restored the chassis to its original condition with Lumina bodywork. It remains on display at the Hendrick Museum. While 005 and Dusty continued their life in ARCA, some cars just moved to other cup teams. Take, for instance, the staple of cars at Go Fast Racing. At Martinsville in 2020, Corey LaJoy led five laps and finished 18th. It was the most laps he ever led up to that point and the story behind the car he was driving was just as good. He was behind the wheel of Roush Chassis 706, built in 2010 as an intermediate car for Greg Biffle's team. When it was new, it was fast right away. Its debut race was at Kansas in October 2010. Biffle led 60 laps and won by 7 seconds. Later that year, Biffle finished 4th with it at Phoenix. In 2011, it was one of the fastest cars at Las Vegas before fuel issues under green cost Biffle several laps. It finished 8th in the Southern 500 before running terribly at Pocono. The 27th place finish at the Tricky Triangle was the last time Biffle drove chassis 706. After that, it spent time at Front Row Motorsports, where results weren't available. Then it was passed on to Go Fast Racing. But that 2010 car wasn't even the oldest chassis raced by Go Fast in 2020. At Talladega in October, LaJoy finished 28th in a car built in 2008. LaJoy was driving chassis number 568, originally built for the number 6 team. With David Reagan driving it, 568 made its debut at Phoenix, where it finished 27th. It was brought back at Dover in June, where it missed a big crash and finished 15th. Reagan himself crashed the car qualifying at Bristol in 2008. Oh, trouble. Oh, man, David Reagan got loose off a of turn four, did what uh, Carl Edwards did, but you can see the results. 
It was a short track car, so it raced three more times at Martinsville in the fall of 2008, Bristol in August 2009, and finally at Martinsville in the fall of 2009 before Roush Fenway stopped using it. Fast forward 10 years and 568 becomes a super speedway chassis used by Go Fast Racing. It was driven in the 2019 Daytona 500 as the famous Old Spice face car. And what in the world is that? <laughs> that is Corey LaJoy on Corey LaJoy's Mustang. After driving a different car in the 2020 Daytona 500, it came back to the track at Talladega in October. But some race cars are left in the weeds. It's a common thing for tracks to get old cars to train their safety crews. The roof is cut off and the rescue team practices extricating a driver. Most tracks have at least one abandoned car hidden on their property, like this group of cars off the backstretch at Talladega, or this mystery car in the woods at Pocono, or this Kevin Harvick Nationwide Series car in the infield at Road America, crashed at Phoenix in 2013. The chassis is RCR B106. Harvick drove it five times in 2012, including a win at Richmond before it was retired after the Phoenix wreck. At Mid-Ohio, they have TRD-037. This truck was built in 2004 when Toyota entered the truck series. Bill Davis Racing owned it and Johnny Benson drove it. Benson's first start for the team came in July 2004, and it was behind the wheel of chassis number 37. In 11 races between 2004 and 2007, the truck won $175,000 in prize money. Its best finish was second at Texas in June 2005. But the end of chassis number 37 came in August 2007 at Nashville. On lap 109, Benson blew a right front tire and hit the wall hard. At that point, the truck was retired. It then made its way to the mid-Ohio road course where track workers cut the roof off for Jaws of Life training. With no further use for it, the truck now sits in a field. Its heavy right side damage still remains visible from its night in Nashville. With dozens of teams and each one running a fleet of cars, vehicles have only a short lifespan in their original form. But for some cars, that's only the start of the story.